nation rich in diversity and tradition, but deeply divided along tribal lines. On the verge of splitting in two, with the potential for more fragmentation in the months and years ahead. A breakup that could quickly deteriorate into another bloody conflict involving nations far beyond its borders. Just some of the reasons why Sudan is at a crossroads. There are whispers of war as the vote for southern independence gets closer and a flurry of diplomatic activity to guarantee the peaceful parting of a nation that's been mired in conflict since independence in 1956. It spent the best part of four decades fighting two civil wars. The most recent resulted in the death of two million people and officially ended five years ago. Today, the same number is homeless in their own country. It's a sad story for Africa's largest nation, home to 44 million people. But that may be part of the problem. South Sudan alone has more than 400 different tribes. Official figures say 8 million live in the south, although the government there says that's a deliberate underestimate by the majority Arab Muslim North. In a moment, we'll get the view from Al Jazeera's Harim Atasa in Juba. First, Mohamed Val has the story from Khartoum. You may think this is Juba, capital of black African South Sudan. But in fact, this is Khartoum, capital of the Arab North. And you may be surprised to see almost no Arab looking faces around me here. But that's what Sudan actually looks like, an essentially black nation. The very word Sudan means black people in Arabic. It's the result of centuries of racial mixing between Arabs and Africans to the extent that ethnicity here is no longer defined by skin color, but rather by how people feel inside. And yet, racial sensitivities were behind 50 years of war in the south and seven years of conflict in Darfur. The black Africans of Sudan feel marginalized and oppressed in comparison to Arabs. And Sudan is about to be the first independent nation in the African Sahel to be officially split along racial lines. A precedent that could be of major concern to half a dozen other countries who have a more or less similar ethnic makeup. Race and religion are very emotional subjects in southern Sudan. The people here are mainly black and Christian. And they feel officials in Khartoum, who are mainly Muslim and lighter skinned, have treated them badly for years. So they see this referendum coming up in January as a chance to separate from the North. And it's widely expected that most people here will vote for independence. So that once they get their own country, they can uh, be controlled of their own resources and look after themselves without interference, some say, from officials in Khartoum. But even if that does happen, there's still the issue of tribalism here in southern Sudan. They may different tribes here, many people of different ethnic groups and for decades they've been fighting each other for control of resources and just control of southern Sudan. How officials in southern Sudan manage these problems is going to be important. So that's the sentiment inside the country. A little later in the show we're in Kenya, Egypt and Israel to find out why the status of Sudan has been watched with such interest in those nations. We'll take a closer look at the popular leaders enjoying support in the north and the south. Plus, the people of Sudan let us know what they really want for the future of their country. Al Jazeera's Hassan Ibrahim takes a closer look now at Sudan's lines of division. Thanks, Jane. Religion doesn't define identity in southern Sudan. Tribe does. And you can find a Muslim, a Christian, or an animist in the same household. Uh, but the fear of uh, most smaller tribes in southern Sudan is being dominated by the larger tribes like the Dinka, the Shiluk, and the Nuer. That fear could lead to rebellions and upheaval. Another uh, reason for the whole southern tribes to unite was that the common feeling of disenfranchisement and marginalization they felt when they dealt with the north in a, in a, in a united Sudan. And that, that fear was even exacerbated by the implementation of Sharia law in Sudan uh, in 1983 uh, during the t a term, term of the dictator Jafar Nimeri. Uh, that implementation of Sharia law uh, uh, intensified the civil war and led to a lot of, uh, of suffering. Uh, the referendum awaited by most southerners could lead to their own independent state, which would be the ultimate answer to all their dreams and aspirations. With a referendum on January the 9th, at least 8 million people may vote themselves into becoming citizens of the world's newest nation. 
but its borders still have to be decided. And there's a possibility negotiations may collapse into a free-for-all where the North and the South battle for the best they can get. Certain resource-rich areas may become key flashpoints. Now, this is a complex issue, so thankfully we have Rokia Abusharaf to help us navigate through it. Let's start off with one of the most fertile areas around and use that as an example. We've got two tribes, the Rizagat and the Misariya Arab nomads. They travel from the north to feed and water their cattle. At the same time, we've got the Mowal Dinka also living on that land, and all three have fought for decades over access and over access to minerals. Do you think this is likely to continue? It is definitely likely to continue given the scale of militarization and given the fact that they will continue to be mobilized. Uh, however, it is also important to understand that these uh, different ethnic groups have coexisted in the past peacefully and managed to resolve disputes. So it's a real worry then, isn't it, knowing that all three groups are stockpiling weapons, they're preparing for border dispute over resources. Let's talk about another strategically important area. This has got to do with water, access to the Niles water and the nearby oil fields. It's a mistake, isn't it, to think that everything that's happening in Sudan and the international interest uh, related to it has got to do with access to oil. It's more to it than that, isn't it? There is more to it than that from the standpoint of different groups, water, land are most crucial. Now, we have uh, the Shilak communities there. They've long battled with the nomadic Hamra Masariya who've started settling there. And of course, you've got the armies from the north and the south. They've joined the battle. You're hearing reports of Khartoum sending weapons to smaller tribes in the south, trying to undermine the support base of the large SPLM. The story is based on the realization that smaller ethnic groups have grievances. Similarly, uh, a lot of people worry that Southern Sudan is also supporting Darfurian uh, uh, segments who did not join the peace process. So potentially a tinderbox. So we haven't even dealt with one of the most controversial areas, the Abye uh, region. This is very strategic, obviously, with natural resources, which has become the focus of a dispute between Khartoum and Juba. Abiyé is crucial because it is where borders are going to be drawn, new maps are going to be recreated. Hence, it relates to questions of identity, and that is why I think it's most crucial. Well, of course, this issue has a wider international impact. Sudan's a major player in the Arab world and also surrounded by nine African nations. All of them are watching keenly to see what will happen in 2011. In a moment, we'll get the view from Egypt and Israel. But first, let's go south to Kenya, where it was pirates who uncovered just how much South Sudan has been able to arm itself. It all began with what was then seen as a simple hijacking of a ship by Somali pirates on the Indian Ocean. But it unearthed a ring by South Sudan's neighbors to arm the semi-autonomous region. The Ukrainian-owned NV Fina was carrying up to 30 tanks and a number of other weapons destined for South Sudan. Yet the Kenyan government, which ordered the arms maintained, they were meant for its defense forces. The confirmation came earlier on in the month on leaked U.S. cables published on Wikileaks that the arms eventually ended in South Sudan. This is potentially embarrassing for the Kenyan government, which mediated the comprehensive peace agreement which brought to an end the war between North and South Sudan. The Sudanese government itself is not making any secret of its arms purchase spree. It says that between 2006 and 2008, it used up to 30% of its annual budget on its military. This translates to up to $2.5 billion annually. But despite all these purchases, South Sudan remains outgunned and outnumbered by the Sudanese armed forces in Khartoum. The North itself has been involved in its own arms race, buying arms from China and Iran. And at the moment, there are fears that in the case of any renewed violence in Sudan, it could engulf the entire Eastern Africa region and could potentially suck in Southern Sudan's traditional allies, Kenya and Uganda. Well, with just a few weeks to go until the people of Southern Sudan vote on whether or not to split from the north, the Arab League is undoubtedly concerned that it could once again have a conflict within its region. 
But it's not just the potential of war that has officials here concerned. There are going to be some diplomatic challenges between the member states if indeed a southern Sudan emerges as an independent country. And one of those challenges is going to have to deal with the issue of water. Would an independent southern Sudan have access to the River Nile in the same way that the entire country has and whether or not it would be beholden to the same historic agreements? But it's not just the diplomatic and political font that has officials worried. Human rights organizations and aid groups are also worried about what the post-referendum era could bring to Egypt. Egyptian organizations are afraid that thousands of refugees in Sudan could spill over into Egypt once again. Over the years, Egypt has absorbed thousands of refugees from previous wars, but has struggled to provide them with basic services and humanitarian aid. And there could be concern that Egypt is once again faced with a humanitarian crisis. With nowhere to work and really nowhere to go, parks like this one in Tel Aviv have become home to hundreds of African immigrants. In fact, today, there are about 30,000 of them living in Israel. A third of those are from Sudan, mostly from the south. Now, this influx of non-Jewish immigrants has become one of the hottest topics in Israel and a serious threat to the Jewish majority in the state. Israel can't forcibly deport these people, but what it's doing is starting with a series of measures to make it impossible for them to stay. Policies such as fining employers who choose to hire the immigrants. Also, there's a project in the Negev Desert building a prison-like detention center that will house up to 10,000 African immigrants as they cross over from Egypt. And lastly, most recently, Israel has begun deporting Sudanese refugees back home. Despite these policies, the refugees are still fighting to stay in Israel, even if it means having to live in dirty and difficult conditions like these. Many of them tell us that they're fleeing persecution back home and that there's simply no future for them and their families in the countries where they're from. So they find themselves not able to go back home, fearing for their lives and living in a country that simply doesn't want them. Let's take a closer look at some of those issues now with Rokhaya Abu Sharaf. Why do you think we should care about what happens in Sudan? Why is it so important? We are talking about a w one million square kilometer that has been looked upon as a bridge between the Arabs and the Africans. So upon division, there is no longer a bridge. So we need to talk about identities in post-referendum, post-bridge collapse Sudan. That's going to be a big issue, isn't it? I mean, who am I if I'm from the north and I've been living in the south? In the south, there is likely to emerge, uh, in spite of its tremendous diversity, a sense of uh, oneness vis-a-vis -vis the north. But the reality of the situation, that is going to be multiple margins, multiple centers, multiple forms of exclusion in southern Sudan and multiple forms of exclusion in northern Sudan. Do you think the split will happen? I think the overwhelming sentiment in, in southern Sudan that it is going to go ahead. And in southern Sudan, you've got this euphoria that it's going to go ahead. The referendum is actually going to go ahead. But underlining that is the fear that the, the dominant, the majority Dinka will take over, will, uh, will ignore the rights of smaller tribes. Do you think that is a possibility? I think it is a well-founded possibility, given the historical experience of smaller groups and the fact that they, are, they felt that Khartoum discriminated against them because they favored the Arabs, but they are going to face yet again another discrimination by Dinka in power. What about those tribes who've managed to coexist until now, the tribes that have come from the north into the south in the Abyei region, for example, do you think a division will inflame tensions there? The division is going to inflame tension in terms of the changing status of different people who are going to cease to be citizens and they are going to be refugees upon the drawing of the border. How do you think this is going to manifest outside the borders? How are the regional players going to benefit from this, take advantage of the situation? Uh, in terms of um, our neighbor Egypt, Egypt had always cared about Sudan, invested a lot in human resources. Uh, they will continue to do so in southern Sudan as they have already started to 
uh, display some sense of commitment towards uh, the Sudan in general, but remains committed to the question and the possibilities of unity in the 11th hour. And you've got Kenya supposedly sending weapons in, so you'll see a lot of movement of people, won't you, in and out of the country? Yes, there is uh, an influx of people from Kenya, from Uganda, from Ethiopia, trying to talk about uh, finding a footing in southern Sudan as a land of opportunity, and in that respect, a speculative land of opportunity. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you very much. Well, if Sudan splits, it'll do so in the shadow of two of the bloodiest civil wars in recent history. And if a third is to be averted, it'll take strong leadership. Salva Kerr in the south is a seasoned soldier, but a novice politician. And in the north, Omar al-Bashir is well known after more than two decades in power. Sudan's strongman, President Omar al-Bashir, a defiant figure in the face of an international warrant for war crimes. A great survivor, he signed up to the army in 1960, fighting from the age of 16. And while war has left millions of his people dead, homeless and destitute, it's benefited Bashir. The farmer's son from the Arabic north rose to the rank of colonel. By 1989, he was able to lead a bloodless coup with Sudan swamped in its second civil war. Bashir began by brandishing a Quran and a Kalashnikov, and put Sudan on a path to radical Islamic reform. Two years later, Osama bin Laden was expelled from Saudi Arabia, so took refuge in Sudan. But by 1996, Bashir, pressed by the US and his neighbors, agreed to expel bin Laden. He's now stepped up the fight with the South, but by the turn of the century, pressure was growing for a negotiated settlement. By 2005, it came with the condition of elections and the right to choose for the people of the South. Hallelujah. But another war had broken out in Darfur in the West. Bashir backed Arab militias in another crackdown. But he was under the international spotlight by now, and in 2008, the ICC accused him of heinous crimes, including genocide. Today, Bashir moves around freely, in spite of being the subject of an arrest warrant. He now looks set to see his country split and it looks likely he'll give up a third of Sudan's territory and its wealth, but not the seat of power in Khartoum. Like his rival in the north, Salva Kiir is a military man who cuts a distinctive figure. He was a founding member of the Sudan People's Liberation Army in the 1980s, rising to be its chief of staff. His companion, John Garang, took care of political issues. But just weeks after being sworn in as vice president under the 2005 peace deal, Garang died in a helicopter crash. Kier had to take over. Observers say he is more committed to secession than his predecessor, but that he lacks diplomatic experience. He told a Ugandan paper politics was not new to him. War is also politics, except for the bloodshed, he said. It was characteristically short and to the point. Kier is from the southern Dinka tribe, but speaks Arabic and English fluently, both languages of the north. In the last two years, he's become more outspoken in calling for the south to break away. He told one crowd that if they opted for unity, they would become second-class citizens. He won April's elections with 93%. But many complained his rivals were intimidated. So Salva Kiir will almost inevitably be South Sudan's first president. He's spent more than two decades focusing on military maneuvers. Now he'll need to learn fast how to play politics if he's to hold this nascent nation together, avert war, and make sure the South gets its share of Sudan's oil wealth. Henry Bellingham is the UK Minister for Africa. He joins me now from London. Minister Bellingham, if the Hello. results of the referendum call for a split and Khartoum allows that to happen, will you push for sanctions to be dropped? The, the U UK only has uh, a small number of restrictive measures uh, against uh, uh, the government of Sudan, against individuals, uh, some uh, bank freezes. So it's not really a question of, uh, of, of the UK or Europe. But yes, if, if we have a smooth... Uh, 
referendum and as a transition. I, I would certainly expect the Americans to have a look of the current situation regarding sanctions, but that's a matter for the U.S., the United States. But you are a permanent member at the United Nations Security Council, so you got mm, some push indeed, there. Indeed, indeed. You no, know, we, we, we certainly have, and, and, and I, I would very much hope that if, if everything goes smoothly and we, 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 we've got agreement by both uh, the leaders, in fact, uh, Bashir and Salva Kiir have made it very clear that they, they want the referendum to take place on time, they, they are determined and committed to having a smooth transition, and if that happens, then I think there will be a, a, a huge amount of international goodwill to, towards, uh, towards Sudan generally. Will that goodwill extend to the International Criminal Court? Because, of course, they've got a, an arrest warrant for Omar al Bashir. That's a, a, a separate matter because we, we, we and all our European and American allies uh, support the ICC process 100%. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the vast majority of countries in the world have signed up to, to that process. And that's a process that's going on separately from, obviously, the, the constitutional and political developments in, in Sudan. And what we're saying to, uh, to, to, to President Bashir is uh, cooperate with that uh, process. And after all, uh, there is a huge amount of, uh, of, of uh, countries around the world that are ex looking to him and expecting him to adhere and to honour the process, and we would, we would expect him to do so. Okay, how do you support the ICC process as well as balance your business interests? You've got $150 billion tied up in bilateral trade, as well as supporting mm. human rights mm. concerns or your human rights drive there. My own view is, is, is that, of course, human rights are very important. And every meeting that I've had with Sudanese ministers, I went to uh, Sudan in, in July, had a chance to talk to a number of ministers in, in the north. We went down to the south and we met ministers in the south. I spoke on the issue of Sudan in the UN General Assembly back in September. And I made it very clear, as has the Foreign Secretary and the International Development Secretary, that our concerns about human rights are very real uh, and, and, indeed, they are concerns that we hope are going to be dealt with and answered. But we don't have uh, any dispute with the Sudanese people. And so, of course, the trade that the UK has with uh, Sudan uh, will continue. Uh, and that trade is about creating wealth. It's about, uh, it's about helping people in Sudan with whom we have no argument. OK, Minister Henry Bellingham, thank you very much for talking to us. It was yeah, yeah. good hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Now, the result of this vote will impact several nations. For the people of Sudan, it will be immediate and emotional. For some, it raises the sweet prospect of self-determination. For others, the bitter threat of war. And then there's the loss of territory. During the time uh, our parents were living with the Arabs and all of you, they were really tortured. So at least we have to give them that freedom. Uh, at least, you know, to, to do whatever they, 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 they think, they, you know, they can do. As a Sudanese citizen who lives with Southerners, I don't want separation and, of course, I strongly support unity. We are going to be separated. We are going to concentrate in one language, that's English, and we are going to be happy as Southerners alone in our side. Separation would be dangerous because, in a worst case scenario, we'll be exposed to Israel. Unity would be much better. I feel so marvelous and joyous that Sudan is separating into two. It's what we have been hoping, looking forward to, at least to receive. Like uh, our people fought and they, they died, a lot of people perished. As a Sudanese citizen, I'm afraid of what could happen after the referendum. It could lead to two states with unresolved differences, and that could lead to conflict in the future. Thanks for joining us for an in-depth look at Sudan, a nation 
at a crossroads.